Shalom, brothers and sisters. This Thursday's thought, I want to share with you my testimony of James Strang as a prophet of the Latter-day Saint movement. When I first heard of James Strang, I was younger, it was before the internet, and the person that was telling me about, about him was basically making fun of him. Um, I didn't know his name was James Strang. I thought it was James Strange, like Dr. Strange, and he was basically telling me how this guy got some other people together and they created a hoax and made some plates to try to make you know make themselves similar to Joseph Smith and and the whole thing failed as a big mess and, and and now they don't exist anymore um but when he told me this instead of thinking ha ha that's funny what a loser the holy spirit said you need to look into this more the problem though was the internet hadn't been invented yet or if it was it wasn't something that we lay people had access to AOL wasn't even a thing yet and so, you know, I went to the library, but in Ohio, you can find some stuff on the reorganized church, the now Community of Christ, but that's really about it. Most of the time when you hear anything about Mormonism, it's it's going to be the Salt Lake City Church. I mean, let's face it, they're they're huge. They may not be in the original church, but now they are the biggest and they are the richest, so they have the most influence and the most power within the movement. And it doesn't really matter whether you like that or not. It, it's a fact, so just deal with it. Well, part of being in that sect meant that I couldn't just go around asking people about James Strang or this book of the law of the Lord. Because you have to walk on eggshells there. It's, it's an interesting church because as long as you're fine, you can do pretty much whatever you want. But the moment you're not, anything you've ever done can and will be held against you in a court of, I guess, what is it, their court of elders. Um and, and I know that from experience and from other people who have gone through this. So I couldn't just go out and ask. I couldn't just go out and look. So how did I find out about this? Basically, I kept my ear to the ground. And whenever someone would bring it up, I would, it was like I was looking for clues. I was like a detective. I would ask them questions and I would piece together the things that made sense. And I did realize, I mean, for crying out loud, this is the sect where people told me all the time, the organized church, they don't believe in the Book of Mormon anymore. They, they've abandoned Joseph Smith. They've abandoned the whole restoration. And that's not true. I mean, even if you look on their website today, yeah, there's members who, of the community of Christ that don't believe in the Book of Mormon. Okay. But as a church, it's still part of their canon. And as a part of the movement, other branches of community of Christ, they still have the Book of Mormon. They still believe in it. So this idea that that, that I had to believe everything I was being told about James Strang well, I couldn't because I couldn't believe everything that they were telling me about the reorganized church. I mean, I've been to Kirtland. I've been to their bookstore. I've talked to their people. So I knew that what they were saying wasn't true. But I had no way of finding out more about uh, the Strangites. Go to Wisconsin. I didn't even know that they were in Wisconsin. People just kept talking about Michigan. And when I met people in Michigan, they would say something about, yeah, something in our history about some island they lived on and they got ran out i, I don't know it's it's I mean, basically they would kind of describe it similar to what happened in uh, missouri or kirtland for the latter-day saints probably more like missouri for for joseph smith's latter-day saints i should say they are latter-day saints so it finally gets to the point to where i've left the salt lake city church and I, I've admitted this before. One of the things I wanted to do was I just want to take my family to another church. I didn't really want to start a new church. Yes, the Lord's calling me to this ministry. Is this a ministry I can do in another organization? So I went online and I looked up the Strangites. And again, there's just not a lot of information. At least there wasn't in 2015. And the information that was there was fairly superficial. I couldn't really get any kind of a deep dive. But I was finally able to find the Book of Law of the Lord. And trying to read through it was very problematic for me because it wasn't like the Bible where it's like, okay, well, here's all these scriptures, a little bit of footnotes, and then lots of notes in the back. It was, here's a little bit of scripture and a ton of notes. And so I really struggled. I was like, so where, with, with the version that I had, the PDF I found, I was like, where do the notes end and the revelation begin and vice versa? It's, it's rather difficult 
and a lot of it was very governmental. And so I, it was, I found it to be very confusing. But man, I love the first two chapters. I really loved the Ten Commandments as found in there, and I loved the One True God. I, I found those to be very, very good, very fascinating. And I understood that the One True God was written by James Strang, so I had a piece of James Strang right here. And I understood that these Ten Commandments were supposed to have come from the plates of brass. And my understanding was that this was the brass, the brass plates of Laban. So at this point, I'm, I'm on the fence, but I'm leaning, you know, God's not telling me to become a Strangite, but I'm feeling it. I'm feeling that he was a prophet. So I go to the Lord. It, 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 the Lord shows me the, the place of brass. And for those who are unfamiliar with, with this, I was not given, this isn't like James Strang or Mauricio Berger, where I'm actually, give, or even Joseph Smith, where I'm given physical plates. But it is more like Joseph Smith in the sense that Joseph never actually turned the pages of the gold plates. He put a rock, first he used an urn and thumb, and he looked into that to read. Uh, but, but the plates were still covered with a cloth. Um, and then later on, he put a rock in a hat, and he, he looked into the hat and translated that way. So my experience was I go into a visionary state, and I have these – I'm in a cave, basically. It's just fire. There's light. And there are these plates of brass sitting on a table. And I'm able to turn the pages. I physically have to turn the pages. When I say physically, I mean in the vision, uh, in, in the visionary state. So I guess, I don't know. Um, my spirit's not leaving my body. I, I don't really know how to express this in, in human words. I'm doing my best here. I apologize. But the thing that is my hand in the vision has to grab a hold of the plate and turn it. So I'm turning the plates, and I ask the Lord, you know, as, as I'm looking at this, it's, it's in Egyptian, and then... When I'm ready to translate, these Hebrew letters come up as fire above it, which isn't a perfect correlation because the Egyptian's kind of up and down and back and forth, um, whereas the Hebrew is from uh, left to right. And so obviously it isn't, you know, matching up to everything. But it's what it says on the page, basically. And I can't read Hebrew. I, I, I know more about it now than I did at that time, but I am definitely not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. And so then the Lord would present me with English on top of that. And so I asked him, I said, if the book of the law of the Lord is scripture, and it is from the plates of brass, then I want you to show me, Lord, where it is in here so I can read it for myself. And so the Lord inspired me on where to turn in the pages until I got to that point where I was able to read the Ten Commandments as presented by James Strang from his translation of the Plates of Brass. And I was like, okay, the book of the law of the Lord is, is scripture. And from that point, point forward, you know, it's like, okay, well, when, we, when we're ready to, to canonize scripture, when we're ready, we started our scripture committee, the book of the law of the Lord was on the table because I knew for a fact that this is scripture, that James Strang had to have translated it because I, I saw the plates myself with my own spiritual eyes. And that's the same way that the witnesses saw the plates. I want to point that out. The three witnesses, an angel presented the plates to them, so they saw it as, as one witness would always say through the spiritual eyes. And the other witnesses, they hefted the plates under a cloth, and they were able to see the drawings that, that were made, the Anton's the transcript, I believe it's called, so when they talk about this idea of hefting the plates and seeing the inscriptions, they weren't literally, okay, well, here's the gold plates. I'm flipping through the pages and seeing the inscriptions. No, they were hefting the plates, and they saw the inscriptions as they were written down on a piece of paper. So my testimony of the plates of brass are more like the testimony of the Book of Mormon witnesses and not like Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon, and not like Mauricio Berger or James Strang's witnesses who actually saw, felt, and hefted and held the plates in their hands. So I do want to sidetrack for a second and say that one of the problems in my mind of the Latter-day Saint movement is we always try really hard 
to have this. Okay, well, this is exactly what happened to Joseph Smith, so this has to be exactly what happens to every other prophet. But that's not the way it worked in the Old Testament. It's not the way it worked in the New Testament. So this idea that, that it has to be exactly like Joseph Smith, I used to think that too, but I've come to learn that, that, that we as prophets can have similar experiences, but because we're all different people, they're not going to be exactly the same, and, and that that is okay. I don't think that Joseph Smith's witnesses are less viable than James Strang's because they saw them physically, and I don't think that Joseph Smith's witnesses are more viable because they saw an angel. I think that both witnesses are viable because, they're, because their testimony comes from their witness that they're given from the Holy Ghost that it is true. So, back to James Strang. At this point, I know that these, these scriptures were translated by a prophet of God. I know that James Strang is a prophet. I've read and studied this letter. I, I know that, that there are members of the Smith family. There are at least one apostle. I think there were two uh, from the original church that, that went with Strang. And there were a number of people. It seemed like more people that came from New York and the Joe Smith background went with Strang. More people that came from the, um, was it the Campbellites, came with Sidney Rigdon, follow Rigdon. And the people that were, you know, in Nauvoo because they were converted by the apostles, all the apostles. Go figure. So, James Strang clearly was a prophet of God. And I want to share with you the introduction and doctrines of the saints, which is taken from the introduction of the first chapter. So, Section one is the introduction and doctrine of the saints, and that is the same as section one in any doctrine of covenants and chapter one in the book of commandments. What doctrines of the saints in the book of commandments have in common is that they share the same, or at least a very similar header. And the header reads, a preface or instructions upon the book of commandments, which were given of the Lord unto his church through him, Joseph Smith, who he, God, appointed to this work by the voice of his saints, Through the prayer of faith. So, what makes James Strang a prophet? I read the letter. The letter was testified by Emma Smith and others that it was authentic. It was it was authenticated by a, uh, a handwriting expert company. I'm not sure how they did that because Joseph Smith normally had scribes do all this writing. But as long as Emma says that, that it was legitimate and these apostles said it was legitimate and these other people said it was legitimate, it's legitimate. And yes, I know that there are those that will admit that it was legitimate that will say he was called to be a stake president. I've read this letter for myself. It's very clear to me that he's saying, I'm about to die and I want you to take over. The Lord has told me to call you to take over. And yes, I know there are eight, at least eight different people or groups of people, and I'm going to get into that in another video. But I do believe that James Strang was called to take Joseph Smith's place. And I do not believe that Brigham Young or Sidney Rigdon did take Joseph Smith's place. But I do believe that they were called by their saints to, and I'll talk about that in, in other videos, to start their branches of the movement. So, in my mind, it should have been James Strang as president, Sidney Rigdon as counselor, because Doctrine and Covenants 90 in the Salt Lake City Church's Doctrine and Covenants, I believe it's 87 in Community of Christ. It's verse 6 for um, the Salt Lake City Church. I'm not sure what verse it is for the uh, for Community of Christ or RLDS. But it says that Sidney Rigdon is equal in power and authority to Joseph Smith. So technically, he is the only person, based on the Doctrine and Covenants, that has any authority to not only be guardian of the church, but be president of the church, because he is one of the three presidents of the church. In my mind, he's a co-president, not merely a counselor. But the Lord told him, I don't want you to be the president of the church. This angel that came to him told him, I want you to be a guardian of the church. Why? Because he called James Strang to be the president of the church. And James Strang is new. He needs someone like Sidney Rigdon to show him the ropes, to help him get it to get you know, where he needs to be in this. And of course, 
The 12 were just supposed to continue being the 12. But the voice of the saints in Nauvoo wanted the 12, not Brigham Young, but the 12 to be the leaders. So in 1847, Brigham Young started a new church with himself as a member of the first presidency, which he did not have the keys of. And yes, I know that Oliver Cowdery did join their church later, but I know of no record saying that he gave them those keys. And they've been very clear that they never had any visions, any revelations, and no angels came to them. And so, therefore, the only people the angel came to were Sidney Rigdon and James Strang. What makes Brigham Young's sect legitimate is what I just read from the introduction, what I like to call a soft scripture. I believe that the Lord had the person that wrote this put this in because this is the testimony that legitimizes the Salt Lake City Church. Every twice a year, when they raise their hands and say, I sustain this person as my prophet and president, that is what makes that person prophet president. They do not have any, any keys to a first presidency. They do not have any keys or authority given to them by God beyond being an apostle. That does not make them usurpers. It does not make them illegitimate. It just means that this is the direction that these saints felt impressed to go in, and that's fine. And that leads me to my problem, if you will, with James Strang. I've been very reluctant to call him a king. I've been very vocal in my opposition. I, I do believe that the reason why Joseph Smith and James Strang were killed, and this is my opinion, I could be wrong, it, it doesn't seem like a coincidence to me that they were, they were both martyred after declaring themselves kings. When you read the Bible, it makes it very clear that God didn't want Israel to have a king. But they demanded it. When you read the plates of brass, it makes it very clear that, yes, God knew that they were going to eventually demand a king, and here's how you do it. But Moses wasn't a king, and God didn't really want them to have a king. He just knew that they would covet the idea of their neighbors. God is very clear in the Torah, the Torah of Joseph and the Torah of, of Judea. We are all kings and queens, priests and priestesses. That's why I wear the talit. Was James Strang a king? Yes. The same way that you're a king. The same way that I'm a king. The same way that everyone that is a member of Israel, every Latter-day Saint, every Israelite, every Jew, every Christian, we're all kings and queens. That's why I wear, again, that's why I wear the tzitzit. That's why you see me with a talit. The talit is my portable temple, and the tzitzis are my mark as a king and a priest to the Most High God. But the scriptures are clear that he wants us all to be kings. I translated the plates of brass the same way that James Strang did using the word king in the places that, you know, where they, where they overlap. There's obviously more in the five books of Moses than in the, the, the book of the law of the Lord. But I did that because I understand human understanding. I understand how the world works. But the Lord wants us to be led by a prophet who facilitates to our needs. And one of the things that James Strang did understand was that king didn't mean ruler over everyone, but a servant of the people. It says so in the book of all the Lord. And it's my understanding from what I've read that that is how he led his people. As he was a servant to the people. And I sustain him as a servant to the people. I will not call him the king of Beaver Island. I, I think that's disrespectful. So some people have asked, if I have a testimony of James Strang, if the Book of the Law of the Lord has been voted as canon for the fellowship, why not the Voria Plates? First off, we have an open canon. So if you believe the Voria Plates are scripture, they are. And I will tell you, I believe that they are. I believe that the person who wrote them was definitely a prophet because the predictions in it came true. It said that in the last days, the saints would be called the Voria would be saved. The U.S. government literally sent an army to Utah to fight a Utah war. 
And I will admit, Brigham Young used excellent strategies and ended up as a, as a draw, as a stalemate. I don't think he won. They weren't able to create their own country like they wanted. But there was still an army that came. They had to bury the temple, the work on the temple. They had to do all these things and change because they were attacked by the literal U.S. government. So the people in Mori were safe. James Strand was told that work was being done on Beaver Island. I think he did it too soon. I think he should have stayed in the safety of Ori until that particular sect was built up enough that they were able to follow those commands of the Lord. I don't think his prophecy didn't come true. I think there's a lot of time left for it to come true. So the reason why we don't vote on the Vori plates, why we didn't vote on them, is because there's nothing in them that really helps us with our salvation. And being an ecumenical movement, it, we really don't need another thing in, in the scriptures that, that separates us. And I feel that, I personally feel, and, and as a committee, there was some sort of agreement because we decided not to include them as a scripture committee, not to include them for a vote. But that doesn't mean that they're not scripture. It doesn't mean that they're not true. The plates of brass, what we voted on was the actual Book of the Law of the Lord. You'll notice that in our version, we don't have the notes. Eventually, we will publish one where we put the notes in the back so people can read them. But we decided as a scripture committee not to include them because there's too much in them where they're attacking other churches. And as an ecumenical movement, that's not what we're about. I think that James Strang, the prophet James, I think he wasted a lot of time fighting with other Latter-day Saints when he should have just been building up the kingdom of God. That just makes him a human being. That's the same problem that we have with every other sect. But I want to talk a moment about the king thing again and why the other reason why it bothers me. I grew up in the Brighamite church. And although this isn't something that someone's going to get up at the pulpit and talk about, there are people that would tell me in, in the secret conversations that the five apostles that head that church were, were secretly the actual, real, legitimate government body of either the United States or the whole world, depending on who you talk to. And it's my understanding that just like Joseph Smith was anointed as a king, and James Strang was anointed as a king, Brigham Young and the apostles, all, all 15 of his apostles, were also anointed as kings, with him being the head king or something like that. So I already had this disposition of, that's weird. I don't like that. I don't feel comfortable with that. So being introduced to this idea with James Strang, you know, and yes, he was crowned king in humility, very much like Jesus walking in as a king into Jerusalem. He had a tin hat on. It wasn't gold. Maybe it was done to mock the kings of the world. I, I don't know. But coming from this idea of, where I didn't like it in the Brighamite movement, I'm not going to magically like it in the Strangite movement. And so I wanted to tell you that because I want to tell you that coming into this, I did do my research previously on because, you know, are these Brighamite leaders really kings? Well, I don't think they really are. Uh, is James Strang a king? I had to kind of start over. I, I took the information that I had. I had people present to me their evidence. But at the end of the day, again, and, and I apologize, I should have put this with the other part. I genuinely do believe that we're all kings and queens. We're all priests and priestesses. And so this idea that, that he was a king in the worldly fashion, I disagree with. But the reason why I bring it up is because recently I did see a video where it was explained to me that James was saying that he was the king, or, or the Strangites were saying that he was the king of the kingdom of God, not of the United States, not of North America. And, and that... So the reason why I said everything I said is because that to me makes more sense than what I was taught as a Brighamite. That still doesn't mean I have to like it because I'm still not happy with the idea of kings. The Book of Mormon says no to kings, says there will be no kings. And yes, I know that people will say that well, that's just talking about the Gentiles. I disagree. Christ is our king. But you're welcome to believe James Strang is a king. You're welcome to believe that anybody's a king. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter because... You're only a king 
if people accept you as a king. My testimony of James Strang is as a prophet, seer, and revelator of Latter-day Saint movement, and that he was the one that was supposed to hold the movement together and move it forward. And I do believe the reason why, while, while other restorationist movements have grown leaps and bounds compared to us, the reason why we are faltering, why there's only, what, uh, is it 15 million of us in the world, 15 or 16 million, the reason why there's so few of us is because we're so busy fighting each other. We're not working together. We're fighting other Christians. When we start learning how to love our neighbors and move forward in faith, I think at that point, we will become the movement the Lord called us to be. We are called to be a prophetic people. And that's why I believe that this introduction, this, this header to the introduction is scripture. As a prophetic people, we're the ones that call the leaders. I was a prophet with a blog until people were moved by the Holy Spirit to vote to recognize me as the first elder in the Fellowship of Christ. But it doesn't make me president or prophet for the entire world or for the whole Latter-day Saint movement. Yet at the same time, it also doesn't mean that some of my revelations aren't for the whole world or for the whole Latter-day Saint movement. And the same is true of James Strang. When you read his prophecies, some of them are for the Latter-day Saint movement. Some of them are for his particular branch of it, the people that accepted him. But I will tell you that as someone who grew up a Brighamite, there are things in that church, beliefs, theologies, policies, that cannot be justified by Scripture. doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means that there's no scriptural backing for them, unless you go to the book of the law of the Lord. I don't have time to get into them right now, but there are certain key things that the Brighamites do that I grew up being told were true, even though they weren't in the scriptures. So when I read the book of the law of the Lord, I was like, well, if, if we just accept this as canon, or well, if we had that church, however you want to say that, that there it is right there. It's in black and white. So therefore, the book of the law of the Lord, in my mind, should be canon for the entire Latter-day Saint movement. Because there's information in there that's beneficial to the whole movement. Which is why, as an ecumenical movement, and as a church, as a fellowship, I, don't really, I still don't really like calling it a church, we accept this book as scripture. Our core scripture, of course, is the Bible and the Book of Mormon. If you don't believe in the book of the law of the Lord, you don't have to. But if you're in a fellowship with us, as we organize, as our organization grows, it's going to make a bit more sense if you are able to read that book because the things that we are doing are in there and in the books of Moses from the plates of brass. So this has been a long one. It's been about a half an hour. James Strang was a, it's an interesting topic that we don't really talk about a whole lot as a, as a movement. As a Latter-day Saint movement, I don't think we talk about him enough as a fellowship. So I wanted to just take some time today and bear you my testimony that James Strang is a prophet of God. That the book of the law of the Lord, as translated by James Strang, is scripture. That the plates of Bori, to me, are scripture. That we would have been so much further along now had we followed the Lord and not fought amongst ourselves. I don't share this testimony with you to try to convince you to become a Strangite. I'm not a Strangite. Or to accept the revelations of James Strang or any of his scriptures. I'm sharing this testimony with you because as an ecumenical movement, I want you to know my beliefs and my faith in, in other prophets of the Restoration, my fellow prophets in the Restoration. 
And as we're organizing, you're going to see a lot of things that will make more sense to you. If you go to the Lord and pray on this for yourself and discover for yourself whether or not James Strang was called to be a prophet. Because we're not going to be rejecting any of the Lord's prophets in this fellowship. So that's my testimony. And I'll leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.